as the UN Special Rapporteur, uh, uh, who is mandated to look into how the rights of indigenous peoples are being respected and fulfilled, uh, the rights to self-determination and the right to autonomy or indigenous governance is one of the basic rights of indigenous peoples that I'm looking at and uh, monitoring whether this, how this is being uh, implemented and uh, protected by governments. So it's very important for me because first, uh, the right to self-determination is really the foundational right for indigenous peoples. But secondly, I think that uh, the right to to be able to set up your own in, and operate your own indigenous governance system is really uh, crucial in terms of uh, ensuring the continuing survival of indigenous peoples. So uh, that's why it's uh, really important and it's, uh, it also gives hope, you know, for me who has been looking at uh, the situation of indigenous peoples and looking at the worst kinds of human rights violations. Uh, when I go to communities and see that see indigenous peoples who are governing themselves, setting up their own education and health systems, it gives me hope that uh, you know that indigenous peoples are really uh, tenacious, tenacious in terms of wanting to put up systems that will allow them to develop a society that they would like to live in. Uh, for me, that's really a sign of hope that things are not as hopeless, you know, as we can see in the other areas of uh, violations of rights. Well, the challenges that I see in terms of how the indigenous peoples are uh, operationalizing their uh, indigenous governance systems, uh, you know, uh, implementing and asserting and claiming the right to self-determination, uh, there are really many challenges. I can see a lot of challenges. First, uh, most nation states wouldn't like to see indigenous peoples being empowered and getting their own, uh, you know, uh, asserting their own right to govern themselves because uh, the governance uh, systems, the values of indigenous peoples as well as their cultures are basically conflicting with the objectives of the nation state. You know, the Asian states would like to engage in, uh, in uh, basically they are obsessed with economic growth. They would like to, to, to go into uh, extractive industries. They are promoting uh, individualism, hyper-individualism, because this is the way that uh, the state can control everybody. So it really goes against the grain of what indigenous peoples like, no? So, so that's first. I think there's a there's there's a major contradiction between the between the objectives, the philosophies, and worldviews of that nation states promote. Uh, it contradicts the values and the worldviews and the cultures that indigenous peoples would like to perpetuate. You know? So that's the first challenge. How do you, how do you uh, match that? You know? and, and, and is it possible to even have these two systems existing side by side? You know? So that's, that's the first challenge. The second challenge is, of course, the, the state, uh, the, the, the nation state, the dominant societies who are not who don't understand indigenous people's rights, they are very discriminatory and racist against indigenous peoples. So they have this uh, mindset that indigenous peoples are stupid, they are savages, they are backward, and therefore they can never govern themselves. You know, so that's the other uh, big challenge that you have to, co to, to counteract. And then thirdly, uh, you know, the, the state employs all its tools to stop indigenous peoples from asserting the right to self-determination. You know, they, they uh, go to the indigenous communities, they, they try to assimilate them into the dominant society if they are resisting against the, the so-called development projects that the state wants to bring to their community. Then they are treated in, in the worst ways, they are treated with impunity. No, they are criminalized, they are displaced, you know, and they are put in jail or they are killed. So that's the, that's the third challenge. How do you deal with that? I mean, it's like bringing all the different forms of human rights violations into the picture. And then, uh, and then uh, fourthly, the states will 
I mean, it will be very difficult for states to provide resources for indigenous governments, no? because they would like to sustain their dominance and their uh, control over the indigenous peoples. So why should they provide uh, resources that will allow indigenous peoples to, to pursue their own development track, which in many cases might not be the same as the development track of the government. So these are the kinds of challenges that they So of course, and then uh, another challenge is the capacity of indigenous peoples themselves to be able to to govern, to self-govern, because of course, uh, many of their systems have been destroyed. Some, in some cases, their languages have disappeared. Uh, they have to really uh, recover the cultural values that they would like to uh, to share and use and tran transmit to their future generations and many of the of what happened to them has destroyed this no so they have to do a lot of recovering re recovering of those that are lost and, 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 and you know they also say that they would like to recover the way they have governed themselves in the past you know and and it's not easy to do that you know after you have undergone colonization you have undergone the oppression under the new nation state so it really requires a lot of effort from the side of indigenous peoples to be able to to do governance how will they run the schools how will they run their health system they have to have enough uh, cap capable young people to be able to do that you know and you don't have i mean look at nunavut for instance, you know, they won autonomy, but they don't have people who can be in the bureaucracy. So almost like maybe 70% of the people in bureaucracy are, are non-indigenous people. No, so, so that uh, you, you, if you don't have a pool of, uh, of capable, uh, 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 you know, technical people, uh, who can run the, the, the government projects, then you really have to rely on others. The main recommendation that I think we should uh, give to the state is first for them to really take a deeper look into the uh, indigenous uh, governance systems and the, their demand for autonomy, how they are operationalizing it. Because I suspect, and I've seen that in these communities who manage to do that, they can show better results no? in terms of well-being of the community, in terms of the social fabric being, being strengthened, in terms of a security. Here in Mexico, you can see that several of the autonomous municipalities kicked out the drug cartels. You know, and if you have a country like Mexico, which cannot get rid of the drug cartels, they should thank indigenous people who manage to do that. And they should, in fact, support indigenous peoples because uh, the failure of government in stopping and eradicating these uh, organized criminal syndicates is, uh, is, uh, is an indication that their governance is really not that good. But if indigenous peoples manage to do that, then by all means they should be supported to be able to continue doing that. Secondly, many data also will show, research will show that uh, many of the world's, uh, you know, uh, more better kept and better sustained ecosystems are also found in indigenous territories. And some of these are the ones who are now exercising their rights to, to autonomy and to self-determination. Uh, here, even here in Mexico, you can see that many of the community forests that have been uh, that have been touted as one of the achievements of Mexico. Most of these are indigenous territories. No, so so, so keeping the forest intact, maintaining the biodiversity in the in the country, a lot of that is to the credit of indigenous people. So I think that the message to governments is for them to look at the positive outcomes of indigenous peoples governing themselves and and acknowledge that these are contributions to national development and that indigenous and stop looking at indigenous peoples as if they are obstacles to national development no so i think those are some of the key messages that we want to give and of course if they are able to maintain better peace and security if they are able to deal with the conflicts amongst themselves and between themselves and others why shouldn't you reward those kinds of efforts. I mean, for me, it's like so 
uh, so logical that that if governments are really not discriminatory, they are not racist, and they are willing to look at the contributions of indigenous peoples and regard and and deal with them in an equal and non-discriminatory manner, then they will realize that indigenous peoples are providing a lot of contribution in nation building. Mm -hmm.